Well, hey, as we begin today's lesson, I want to ask you, have you ever forgotten somebody's birthday? Have you ever forgotten an anniversary? Well, maybe you have, and maybe you did something to help you remember that in the future. Maybe you set a reminder on your phone, or maybe you wrote it down somewhere so you wouldn't forget next year an important date. You know, all through Scripture, God reminds us that we are to remember Remember this, remember that. And usually that's followed by a statement of something God's done for the people of Israel, something God's done that needs to be remembered. Well, today we're going to look at the life of Jesus and where he's going to give us an activity to participate in to help us remember something he's done, to help us remember something that we don't need to lose sight of. You see, today Jesus is going to tell us about the Lord's Supper. He's going to show us how to remember his death and what that means for us. You know, all through Jesus' life, uh, we see the importance of meals. He had meals with those who were close to him to teach them, to show them things. He had meals with people he wanted to draw into the community, people he wanted to show love to. Meals are very important. They help us connect with one another. They help us connect with, with, uh, with the people we might not know well, people we might love already. Meals are important. But the most important meal that we as believers can partake of is the Lord's Supper. Because that reminds us not just of what God's done in the past, but what God's going to do in the future. You see, we're going to have a meal with Jesus one day. We're going to have a wedding meal with Jesus when we get to the end of all things. And so today, let's look at the Lord's Supper, and let's look and see that Jesus' death and Jesus' sacrifice needs to be remembered. Look with me at Luke chapter 22, verses 7 through 13. Then the day of unleavened bread came, when the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, "'Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover.'" Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked him. Listen, he said to them, when you've entered the city, a man carrying a water jug will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters. Tell the owner of the house, the teacher asks you, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished room upstairs. Make the preparations there. So, so they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. Now, Jesus is trying to get ready for the Passover. The Passover meal is a very important day, a very important event in the life of Israel. You see, the Passover reminds them of what God has done in the past. You see, when the people of Israel were still enslaved in Egypt, God uh, had a series of plagues come upon the land to try and get Pharaoh to let the people go. But throughout the process, Pharaoh continued to harden his heart and continued to not listen to Moses and not obey the Lord. So finally, God sent one last plague on the land. And this plague was going to be a terrible plague, a terrible event in the life of Egypt. And to protect God's people from the coming plague, God gave them instructions. He says, I want you to put the blood of a lamb on your doorpost. Paint that on your doorpost so that when the... Death angel flies over, passes over, he will pass over your house, and you won't be uh, subject to the plague. And then when the people finally get out of Egypt and they get out into the desert and get into their, into on their way to Israel, on the way to the promised land, God institutes the Passover meal where he teaches them to remember what God has done in the past. And it includes eating certain things and includes doing certain activities. And, and in time, it included offering a sacrifice uh, to the Lord, sacrificing a lamb to the Lord. You see, all this points to Jesus. And so here's the Lamb of God getting ready to go to the cross, getting ready for the Passover meal. And getting ready for the Passover meal is not a simple task. It's not like calling up someplace and ordering out for dinner and and getting together. No, Jesus was getting ready for the Passover meal for a large group of people. It was him and his disciples. So he he puts two disciples on the task. He says, I want y'all to go into town. I want you to find us a place to eat, and I want you to get ready for the Passover. You see, that they had to go, they had to find a place to eat, and Jesus told them how to do that. Go find the man with the water jug, follow him in, and, and secure the location. Then he said, also, get ready for the meal. 
They had to go out and they had to get all the food and all the drink and everything ready for the meal. And that included going to the temple. That included uh, getting, getting the lamb ready and getting all these things ready for the Passover meal. And Jesus says, Peter and John, I need y'all to do that for me. I need y'all to get ready for the Passover. Now, remember today we're talking about the Lord's Supper, which Jesus is going to institute during the Passover meal that night. So let me ask you this. As you get ready for the Lord's Supper, what are some things you might need to do? What are some things a person might need to do to get ready to celebrate the Lord's Supper? Now, Peter and John had to secure a location for the Passover meal. Peter and John had to go and get all the stuff it took to do the Passover meal. But what do we need to do to get ready for the Lord's Supper? Well, we need to prepare our hearts. They prepared a place. We got to prepare our hearts. We have to get ready. We have to talk to the Lord and get ready. Why? Because it's important to do that. It's important to be ready to remember what Jesus has done. But before we get into the Lord's Supper itself, I want us to look for a second at why Jesus wanted to have this meal, this Passover meal with these disciples. Look at me at Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 18. When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. Then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Now, Jesus understood the significance of this meal. He understood it was important. And it's interesting, these verses 15 and 16 are actually unique to Luke. They're not recorded in the other Gospels. And I think they teach us something very important about what Jesus knew was about to happen. You see, Jesus has three things he says here. He says, I fervently desired to have this meal with you. Jesus was looking forward to the cross. Not that he was looking forward to it. He was looking forward toward it. He was looking toward the cross, and he knew that he wanted to have this meal with these disciples, with these apostles, because he knew what was about to happen. He wasn't looking, wasn't looking forward to it, but he was looking forward toward it, and he knew this would be the last time he would be able to sit quietly with these men who he had spent so long with, sit quietly with them and just have a meal, and have one last opportunity to teach them about himself and about what's to come. Then he says, before I suffer. See, Jesus was looking toward the cross and he knew what was about to come and he wasn't looking forward to it, but he knew what was about to happen. And he, he says, before I go through all that, I, I need to sit down with y'all. I just need to take a moment and be with you. Then he says, I will not eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom, in the end. Jesus knew that this was an important meal. He knew this meal represented what he was about to do. Look with me at Revelation verse chapter 19, verses 7 through 9. It says, Let us be glad, rejoice, and give him glory, because the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has repaired herself. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. He also said to me, these words of God are true. Jesus knew this was an important time. He knew this was an important event because it points toward the end. It points toward what he was meant to accomplish. These verses out of Revelation, they, they point to a people made pure, a people made righteous who are invited to this feast. How do you get made pure? How do you get made righteous? How do you get invited? It's because of what Jesus did on the cross. We're invited because of what he did for us. And Jesus knew this day, this, this meal with his apostles pointed toward that. And he wanted us never to forget what he is about to do because we can't look forward to the end unless we remember what he's done. That's why it's important that Jesus teaches about the Lord's Supper. I want you to take a moment. I want you to consider this question. If you've got somebody with you, consider it with them. When you are reminded of what Christ has done for you 
and look forward to the celebrating with Him in the end, what is one practical way you can respond with your life? We respond to what Christ has done for us by the way we act, by the way we live. When, when Jesus asks us or the Holy Spirit prompts us to give, we give. When the Holy Spirit prompts us to go tell, we tell. When the Holy Spirit prompts us to stop doing something or stop thinking a certain way, we, we, we ask him to help us to stop doing that. And we try and live righteously. You see, there are practical ways that we can respond to what Christ has done for us. Only you know what God's asking you to do. But we respond by living the life he's called us to live. So let's take a moment now and let's look and see what is the Lord's Supper? Actually, what does it mean and, and what's it all about? And let's, let's see what Jesus taught his disciples. Verse 19, And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now, we don't like to think a lot about blood in our 21st century lives. I mean, the most blood we normally see is if a kid scrapes their, their, their elbow or scrapes their knee when they're out playing, or maybe you see a little blood when you bring your steak home for dinner or you throw it on the grill. You see, we don't see a lot of blood. We don't like to think about a lot of blood. But see, Jesus says, this wine represents my blood that's poured out for you. Why is that important? Look at me at Luke at, at, at Exodus 24, 8. Moses took the blood and splattered it on the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you concerning all these words. He took the blood and splattered it on the people. Now, that's not something we normally do. But remember, this is a whole different culture, a whole different world where they understand things differently. Moses reminded them that this blood that I have from this animal, it represents a covenant that God has made with you. A covenant is a relationship between two parties where they each have a responsibility in that relationship. And the responsibility of the people is to be righteous. The responsibility of God is, is in some ways to take care of the people. And so Moses is saying this blood represents this agreement between you and God. Look at Leviticus chapter 17, verses 11. For the life of the creature is in the blood, and I have appointed it to you to make atonement on the altars for your lives, since it is the lifeblood that makes atonement. Not only did the blood represent the covenant between Israel and God, the blood, God said, is what's used to make atonement. Now, atonement, what does that mean to make atonement? Well, Jesus or God is saying, I'm going to use this blood in this instance to make you right with me. We don't make ourselves right with God. Israel brought the blood. God used the blood to make them right with him. Now, what does all this have to do with the Lord's Supper? Look at Hebrews chapter 7, verses 22. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. In the Old Testament, there are many covenants. But the covenant we're talking about is the one between God and Israel. The, the covenant that makes atonement possible, makes, makes a rightness between God and the people possible. Hebrews tells us that Jesus' blood, though, makes for a better covenant. A covenant that makes us right with God forever. In the Old Testament, they had to offer blood again and again and again to make up for their sins. Jesus comes, he offers his life once, he spills his blood once, and we're made right forever. Jesus' blood that he was represented in that wine at that table with his apostles, Jesus' blood is what makes it possible for us to have rightness with God. We don't like to think about that in the 21st century, but that's what God did, and that's what God continues to do in our lives daily. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ offered his blood once, and he provides atonement for us forever. 
but God knows that we are a forgetful people. So he says, drink this cup, eat this bread regularly and often to remember what I've done for you. We can look forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb, but if we don't remember what God did on the cross, we are never going to live the life he's called us to live because when we lose focus of what Jesus has done and what Jesus will do, we forget what we're supposed to do. I want to challenge you this week. When we as Christians participate in the Lord's table, we must recognize that we are all there by grace. What are some practical ways that you can move toward reconciliation with others before you partake in the Lord's table? Jesus offers us reconciliation with God. We can't go to the table. We shouldn't go to the table of the Lord to take the Lord's Supper if we are on the outs with somebody else. So I want to challenge you this week. Are you on the outs with somebody? Do you need to reconcile yourself to somebody as a picture of the reconciliation that Jesus has caused between us and God? And then are you ready to take the Lord's Supper? I want to see you all again next week as we continue through our book of Luke.